Welcome to Around Kappa. In this episode, Superintendent Joe Farley interviews Dana Hills High School teacher Randy Hudson, one of the county's teachers of the year. Mr. Hudson will be one of those recognized on Friday, October 25th, during the annual Orange County Teacher of the Year celebration at the Disneyland Hotel. Hi, I'm Joe Farley, Superintendent of the Capistrano Unified School District, and we're in the Dana Hills High School classroom of Randy Hudson, a marine ecology and biology teacher here, and he's been identified as one of the uh, Teachers of the Year for the Capistrano Unified School District, and one of the top three or four, three or? It's actually five, because they have community okay, college. So one of the top five uh, teachers for all of Orange County. So Randy, when you think about your teaching, what, what do you think really stands out that makes you just an extraordinary teacher? And you, and you are an extraordinary teacher. I, I, I try to bring uh, my passion to the classroom. I really try to, to bring that alive for students by making it real for them and relevant. I don't want ever students to go home asking why did we have to learn these things. I'm always trying to connect science to their lives. And so I look back on what worked for me as a student, what didn't work, and the field experiences that I had outside of teaching before when I was going through college really helped to solidify things for me. And it was apparent that if I, I was so much better learning by doing. And so I bring that to, to my classroom for my own students rather than just going through things we're trying to do a lot of hands-on learning, bring it alive, make it applicable and meaningful to them so that it gives them stronger anchor points and they can come back and recall that when we later on. Well, you know, we're hearing a lot about this area of real life uh, application and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, connectedness with kids, but what precisely do you do in a classroom to make that happen? Like, what, like give us an example of, say, a lesson that would accomplish that. Okay, well, for example, right now in marine ecology, we're learning about plate tectonics. So here I'm trying to teach them about something that's theoretical. Nobody can really see it happening. Nobody knows what's really in the earth. We all just use data to kind of come up with, an, with a hypothesis or a theory about what's going on. And so to actually model how things are actually going in those, within these processes, I'll have like a tank of water all set up here. And within that tank of water, I'll have a, a light behind it. So we'll have the lights off and I'll have hot water and cold water. And to them, they think, okay, hot and cold, no big deal, but you add color to it and then allow it to start doing its thing and you can actually model convection going on. Mm -hmm. So rather than just telling them that heat rises and cold falls, now they're seeing something happening dynamically in front of them. It's colored, it's moving, and it's basically illustrating a process. Now compare that with a diagram in a book, and this is gonna have a greater impact on their learning. And not only that, but then you can add blocks to it, and continents now start spreading apart as a wood block separates from another wood block, and they can equate that to seafloor spreading. Mm -hmm. And so things like that, that make the learning concrete, they can go back and, and touch upon that memory of seeing this dynamic thing. It, rather than just seeing it or reading in a book, the recall factor is so much higher. Mm. You know, labs, engaging them in a lab or bringing them outside in the field affects them at a much deeper level that makes their learning that much stronger. Okay. Um, I've visited your classroom a few times and I've learned a lot about you since you're our teacher of the year and our county representative. You are an excellent instructor, but you also are absolutely loved by your kids. <laughs> how, do you, how do you balance that? Well, it's, it's, it really comes down to uh, a saying I believe in that people really don't care how much you know until you know, they know how much you care. And so it's, it's little things really, it all adds up. You know, even this Monday is our first Monday after you know, the first week of school. And what we start every Monday off in my class is weekend stories. Real simple, five minutes of class where kids are telling me what they've done that past weekend you know, whether it be a sporting activity, they're involved in a drama production, they're visiting with their family, friends, it was a birthday, even if they went to a movie and they're letting everybody know if they liked that. Little things like that, where we're talking about, I'm sharing things that I've done with my kids through Indian princesses or coaching soccer, and so it's, it kind of develops this relationship that evolves throughout the year where it's a connectedness. And I'm asking them questions about them, they're asking questions about me, and that kind of opens the doors. 
And what that does subconsciously is it makes my students feel more comfortable later on to ask those questions that they may not otherwise have asked in class, to you know, take the, the risks to advance their learning beyond their comfort level. And it really kind of creates a dynamic in here that makes students feel worth, I guess worthwhile. They feel like they, they have a place in this class, they feel comfortable in this class. And from there, plus me kind of sharing more funny stories, a lot of my instruction is story-based. Again, giving them something that they can relate to versus just a lecture, a PowerPoint lecture. They can relate to something that's happened to me that's often comical. I mean, and if I can laugh at myself, they feel more apt to laugh, I'll laugh at themselves. And it just makes it feel more like a, a family than a classroom. It's interesting because observing you, you do it without being their best friend or their buddy. You still retain that um, role as their teacher, the, the adult in the classroom. Correct. Um, that's an important piece to it. How do you do that? It's it comes down to respect. You know, I th I think people will often re reflect what you kind of how you act towards them. It's kind of the golden rule of practice. And for me, you know, we do have expectations kind of stray away from the word rules, but there's things that I expect of them, and I'll lay that out very early and kind of reinforce it at the beginning of the year, and, and you know, I find myself not having to have discipline problems. Often, you know, I also believe that an, an engaged classroom manages itself, that if you were, if kids are bored, if kids are not engaged, then they're going to find something else to, you know, buy their attention. Whereas if they're in, deeply engaged in the content matter, if we're doing things in lab that requires them to be on top of it, they're going to enjoy coming to class because there's something in every day. We're hearing a lot about this new initiative, the Common Core Standards, mm -hmm. and it talks about greater level of analysis, more uh, real-world application, uh, digging deeper, basing conclusions on solid de evidence, on text and things. It seems like you've been ahead of that almost in the classroom. Well, I think science innately kind of lends itself to Common Core. It's, it is based in analysis, and what I would like people to see about science is that it is kind of that, that subject matter, if you will, that links a lot of what we've been putting so much emphasis on. If you look at our history over the last decade, we tend to only test language arts, and we tend to only test you know, mathematics. We seem to only put an emphasis in those two subject areas, where if you look at science, it's the, it's the hub that connects those two. We're constantly analyzing things numerically and quantitatively. We are writing and explaining our learning. We're doing that in lab reports and trying to put things together, looking at all possibilities. And I think it, it lends itself to Common Core. For, for me, I would like to, I kind of think the Common Core, it sounds, it's, it's big, it sounds kind of daunting, but in my opinion, it's, it's a baby step in the direction that we really need to go. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see us going a little bit further in and having more opportunity to link with my cohorts in the English department and the math department to have fanatic instruction that transcends any subject barriers. If anyone could do that, Randy, I think it's you. I'd love to do it. <laughs> uh, we have students that will probably be watching this uh, as well. Um, I'm curious to know, what kind of high school student were you? <laughs> I was average. If you looked, if you went purely by numbers, I was average. and. Like I said earlier, my dad was always, you know, wanting me to get A's and B's. His rules were, as long as you have no C's, it's okay. So I kind of shot low when I was getting B's. And I never really was, I guess you can say, encouraged to apply myself. I really loved being in my uh, industrial arts class. I took wood shop as a freshman, and the UC lowered their, uh, relaxed the language requirements. I took it again as a senior. I loved it. I still do it today. But everything else was I was doing it because I had to do it. And it wasn't until I got to college and I really had to prove to him that I, was, I didn't want to be an engineer, I really wasn't into math, and I wanted to do science. And to kind of prove to him that I could get a, a job in science, I really sought you know, application. So I was going out and doing science. I was volunteering in labs and doing, I became a research diver. And I was doing research in the field for professors. And that really opened doors for me and all the time when I was doing things, it seemed to reinforce what I was learning in class. I'd seen it in class, it really didn't stick until I had experienced it doing something scientifically. And seeing that and experiencing those epiphanies in my own learning 
maybe seek, I, I know now how I can make this understandable for kids who are in high school, to give them something that I didn't have, which was kind of a, a broader perspective, a greater view of how everything kind of meshes and fits together. So when did it click that Randy Hudson should be a teacher? <laughs> well, I wasn't in teaching, I, I was in consulting for the first couple of years, and decided that I wanted to go back and get a higher degree, and I actually wanted to go and teach at, a, at least a JC level. Because I had an instructor, Tom Garrison, Dr. Tom Garrison, who was excellent. Still today is my greatest teacher. I wanted, I wanted his job. He taught marine science. So when I really started looking at it, I, uh, it all came down as a whirlwind. I, I'd applied to grad school. The funding fell through, so I had to wait a year. And two weeks later, the company I was working for went public. And they, in order to look attractive on the stock market floor, they, they had to downsize costs. So they, they basically laid off everybody who didn't have a PhD. So now I was no grad school plans, no you know work to basically fall upon. So we, we came back to California, and I said, all right, maybe I'll try getting into something else. It wasn't working. And my father-in-law says, well, hey, you're always talking about science, telling us what you know. Why don't you try high school? Give that a give that a shot. See if you like it. So I went and started volunteering in a class. Started substituting, and I loved it. It was working out. And so I said, all right, I'm going to go for this. And and it worked out. Well, it's also worked out for all your kids. You've done a great job. You do amazing work here at Daniel Hills High School, and we're all really proud of you as a teacher. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.